the Tolt River incarnation. And we're gonna do a salmon stream survey today. So why are we doing this? Well, salmon in the Pacific Northwest are a super important species. They're born in rivers like this, start growing up there, travel down to the ocean where they spend their adulthood, and then come back to that same river to spawn as adults and have their own babies. And throughout that whole life cycle, in the stream and in the ocean, they're really important to the ecosystem. They're predators for a ton of different species. Here they're eating bugs, in the ocean they're eating plankton and other fish, and throughout they're also the prey for a lot of different species. So as babies, they might be eaten by bugs. They might get eaten by bigger fish, or by birds, or by otters. Out in the ocean they're eaten by sharks, by sea lions, even by orcas. And then as they come back as adults, when they spawn, they can be eaten by bears, by coyotes, all sorts of other critters. And the most important part of this is when they spawn, they die here in this river. And their bodies decompose and are awesome food for the bugs in the stream, for all the different organisms around, even for the trees here. As their bodies decompose, they grow into the ground, they become part of the nutrients of the soil, and the plants and the trees that live on the bank get to use some of those nutrients too. People in the Northwest also rely on salmon. So they're really important to our commercial and recreational fisheries. And since time immemorial, they've been central to the culture and diets of the Coast Salish people who live in this region. So salmon are super important and we want to make sure that their habitat is healthy. Today, we're going to try to figure out whether the Tolt River is healthy salmon habitat. And we're going to do that using our science journals and a few different tools. In these journals, we're going to look at four aspects of stream health. So we're going to look at the stream bottom, at the geology of the stream first. We're going to look at the riparian zone, which is the plants growing along the stream. We're going to look at the bugs in the stream, because that's what those baby salmon eat. And then we're going to look at the water quality. We're going to look at the water chemistry to figure out whether it's healthy for our salmon. All right, are you ready? Let's go. All right, so first we're going to look at the riparian zone of our stream. And the riparian zone is the area of vegetation that grows along the stream. So the stream is right over here and all of this land up until the trail off to my left is the riparian zone. This area gets flooded sometimes during the high flow events in the spring when the river's really high and the rest of the time it's dry like it is right now. The riparian zone is super important because these plants do a few different things for the river. They help keep the soil in place so all of their roots are holding the soil so it doesn't get washed away into the stream and they also provide shade for the stream. So when these trees grow tall and hang over the river, they're keeping that river cooler and salmon need to have cool water to survive. The way we're going to assess a riparian zone is with something called a transect. So transects are something that scientists do to measure what is living in an area. And it's just a straight line where we count what's on either side. So I'm going to lay out this rope, which is 20 feet long, and we're going to see what plants we can find along that rope within arm's reach. So if I stand on that rope and reach out to the side, if I can touch a plant, I'm going to count it. doing it this way is it gives us an idea of what grows along this whole river. So rather than measuring every single tree on the entire riverbank, that would take forever. If we just do a quick transect, that'll give us a general idea of what's growing here. So here I am 
on my transect and this is the first plant I'm going to look at. And there's a few different things I'm going to look at when trying to figure out the plant, what kind of plant it is. One is how are the leaves arranged? So are these leaves opposite from each other? So they look like this on the stem, or are they offset from each other so they look more like this? We're also going to look at the buds and at the leaf shape. So one of the first thing I notice when I touch this bud is it's kind of sticky. And that's pretty unusual. So I'm going to take note of that. When I look at these leaves, I would call them to be sort of like a heart or a shape, spade shape. They start out branching pretty wide and then coming down to a tip. And if I look at the arrangement on this whole stem, the clusters of leaves are alternating from one spot to the next. So there, when I look at one cluster, there isn't another one directly opposite it. So I know it has an alternate leaf arrangement. And since it has alternate leaves that are kind of heart or shades, spade shaped, and it's got this sticky bud, I know that this is a black cottonwood. So I'm going to put that on my notes. And you're probably familiar with black cottonwoods too, especially in the spring when it looks like it's snowing. You might have noticed that earlier in the video. We have all of these cottonwood seeds falling through the air. And the reason they can do this is they've got all this fluff on them. All this fluff stuck to the seed and that helps them fly. For a tree, that's really important to help the seeds disperse. If you're a tree, you don't want your babies to land right next to you and start growing there because now they're competing with you for resources. You want them to land far, far away where they can get new resources that aren't going to take away from yours. So all of those fluffy seeds on the cottonwood or on dandelions help those seeds get really far away. All right, so here's our second tree. And as I'm identifying my trees, I'm going to try to use these different native plant guides to figure out what kind of trees I'm looking at. This tree is also alternately arranged, so its leaves come out one after another rather than being together. Its leaves are kind of hairy. You might be able to see how shiny and white they look, and that's because they've got little hairs on them. They're much smaller than the cottonwood, so they're only a couple of inches long and much narrower. And based on all of that, I'm pretty sure this is a Pacific willow. Pacific willows are a super common tree in the riparian zone around here, and they're really interesting and useful because people use these trees. So this is actually where we get aspirin from, from willow trees. Upon a deeper field guide dive, I suspect this is actually a Sitka willow, closely related to the Pacific willow. The leaves of a Pacific willow come to a narrow tip, while the leaves of Sitka willow are more broad, like the plant that we found. Both species are common in local riparian zones. This is where being a scientist is like being a detective, using clues to make your best guess and then refining and changing your answer as more clues or resources arise. So this is my next tree. It's much bigger than the other ones that we found. And one of the first things you might notice is its leaves are humongous. This one, unlike our other trees, has an opposite leaf arrangement. So these leaves come out across from each other. And that tells me that it's probably a maple, an ash, or a dogwood. If you have ever seen the Canadian flag, you probably know what a maple leaf looks like. One of the main things that we know about maples is that they're palmate, which means they branch out. Instead of being long and skinny, they have these multiple lobes. And so this is a maple tree, and it is the very originally named Big Leaf Maple Tree. So I'm going to add that one to my list, and we'll see what else we can find. This is our first invasive plant, and what we've looked at so far have all been native plants. Native plants are plants that have lived here and evolved with the rest of the ecosystem for hundreds or even thousands of years. And so they're pretty well in balance. They have natural predators here. They have herbivores here that might depend on them. Invasive plants are different. They're plants that were brought here sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose by people, and now they're really taking over because they might not have any natural predators. 
And this is our first one. This is called Scotch Broom. And the way I know that it's Scotch Broom is it has all of these yellow flowers. You might have seen Scotch Broom growing along the highways. A lot of times there are native or there are invasive plants growing along highways because it's a really stressful environment. And something that helps invasive plants be invasive is they can tolerate all sorts of stressful places. So they're really well able to compete along those highways and roadsides. So we have these flowers and they also have these seeds that kind of look like pea pods. And those pea pods are another identifying characteristic of Scotch broom. And finally, all of its stems are green and it even has these little ridges along the stem. And that's the third thing that we can notice to know that this is Scotch broom. All right, this is our last plant that's on our transect and it is another invasive. So this is Himalayan blackberry. And there's a couple ways that I know this. One is that it's everywhere. And that's a pretty good sign that you have an invasive plant. This whole bank behind me is blackberry and it keeps going all along the whole trail that I took to get here. Himalayan blackberry usually has five leaflets and sometimes it's a little tricky where two of those smallest leaflets will get fused to the other ones. So this one only really has three, but there's two stuck together on this part. And Himalayan blackberry is super spiky. There are thorns everywhere. Just walking in here, I was getting a little bit stuck, but there are big thorns on the stem, even on the undersides of the leaves. Himalayan blackberry around here was originally a cultivated plant. So it was a plant that people grew for food and it has now escaped the farms and gotten everywhere. You've probably seen this one along roadsides too. When we're thinking about why the riparian zone is important, we also want to think about how much of the plants that we find are hanging over the stream. So we're gonna look around and see how much of the stream has trees hanging over it and how much just has stream or has trees growing along the side. And as we look, most of what we see is just trees growing along the side. There isn't a whole lot of shade over the stream, except for a little bit downstream of our site. We also want to look for wood in the stream. So woody debris is logs and branches that fall into the stream and can then create things like pools where baby salmon can spend some of their life and hide from the stronger current. So we want to have a lot of wood in the stream and right now I only really see the couple of pieces right at the base of this bridge. All right so now it's time to rate the different parts of our riparian zone. First we want to look at native plants growing around along the stream bank. And we found mostly shrubs and trees. We didn't really find any grass or all that much bare soil. So we're gonna circle excellent for that one. We also looked at trees and shrubs hanging over the stream and we didn't really see much at all. So I'm gonna put a no. We looked at the amount of woody debris in the stream. There were many pieces, a few pieces or none. And we found a few pieces. And then we're looking at invasive species. So do we find no invasives, a few, or lots? And I'll say we found a few. So we have one excellent, a poor, and two mediums. And I think overall I would rate our riparian zone as a medium. We definitely could have had more native plants growing along the stream blank, um, and a lot more trees and shrubs hanging over the stream, but we did have a few hanging over. So overall, I'd give it a medium rating. All right, so the next aspect of stream water quality we're gonna look at is the stream channel. And the channel is just the land where the stream is flowing. The first thing we wanna look at is the shape of the stream. So a healthy stream is shaped like an S. If a stream is straight, it doesn't have enough differences and different habitat types to have a healthy ecosystem need to have some areas called pools that are slow moving where they can rest or when they're babies where they can hide and not get swept away by the currents and then other areas called ripples which are much faster moving and help bring oxygen into the stream. So if 
if we look around, the street curves off to my right and then curves off again to my left. It's pretty well S-shaped, so I'm going to call that an excellent in my journal. We also want to look at woody debris. So I mentioned that briefly in our riparian zone section. Woody debris is any branches, logs, sticks, or pieces of trees that might be in the street. And they come from the riparian zone. That's another reason that we need a healthy riparian zone. If there aren't trees near the river, they can't fall in and provide that woody debris. And the woody debris, once it's in the stream, is going to provide some of those pools. So it dams up little sections so the area behind it will be slower and can provide a refuge. It's also really important food for the bugs that the salmon eat. So bugs in the stream will eat the wood and then salmon gets to eat those bugs. We want to have at least a thousand pieces in a section of stream about this big. We don't have that many. We've got about three or four up against this pylon over here. Some of them are pretty big, some of them are pretty small, but we don't have much woody debris here. So that's going to be a four for our rating. I mentioned those pools and ripples. We want to have some areas that are really slow or even still, and some areas that are much faster, which are the ripples. You can tell where a ripple is because there are bubbles. So you can see all of these water bubbles, the little rapids, all those bubbles are air. That's how the stream can get more oxygen into the water. And these ripples are super important because the salmon need to breathe that oxygen. We want to have a pretty much equal number of ripples and pools. So if I look out here, I can see some slow edges on the far bank, but mostly I see ripples. So I'm going to give that another four rating. It has many more ripples than pools right now. At a different time of year, though, that might be different. Where I'm standing right now is an old gravel bar, and there's tons of rocks on the bottom that look like they've been washed around. So I think if the water was higher, there would be a lot more pools in this area. Next, we're going to look at the stream bottom. For a healthy salmon stream, we want that bottom to be covered in gravel and cobbles. So gravel is like pebble-sized rocks, and cobbles are things more around the size of your fist or of both of your fists put together. When we have a stream bottom that's made of cobble and gravel, there's plenty of room for the baby salmon and the eggs to safely hide in the cracks between the rocks without getting covered by sand or silt that would make it so they didn't have enough space to grow. This area is where this kind of substrate is perfect for making salmon nests. So let's see what the bottom of the stream looks like. So we're looking at the bottom of the stream and I'm just gonna take a fistful and see what I get. And I'm getting mostly those cobbles and gravels. So I've got a couple of small cobbles, some bigger gravel, and not much else. There's a little bit of smaller, pebbly, sandy stuff, but for the most part, we have cobbles and gravels. So that's perfect. That is going to get an excellent. We're also going to look for erosion. So signs of erosion could be gullies, could be areas that look like little stream beds going down into the real stream. We don't really see any of that. So we have a very stable bank. I think we're pretty good on the erosion front. And last, we're going to look for built structures. We don't care so much about things like this bridge, but what we're really worried about is dams and culverts. So things that are going to block the water flow. Here, we don't have any. So that's also going to be an excellent. And the last thing we'll measure is velocity. All right, so the last thing we're going to test is velocity. And velocity is how fast the water is moving. And to know that, we need to know I'm going to take my transect rope and stretch it out. That'll give me distance. This transect rope is 20 feet. And so I can measure a big part of the water and how far it travels in 20 feet. But it's kind of hard to do that with just some water. Because I don't know which molecule is which. So I'm going to use a stick. What we're going to do is we're going to throw this stick into the water at one end.
So that took 5.4 seconds. And to get a better idea of what it looks like, I'm going to do that three times. I got 5.4 seconds, 5.4 seconds, and 2.2 seconds. And that's just a time. And what I want is a speed. I want to know how far it went per one second. So my first step is going to be to average those three times to figure out its average time to go 20 feet. And then I'm going to divide to figure out the rate in one second. So I have that it went 20 feet in 5.4 or 2.2 seconds. I want to know how many feet it went in one. So I'm going to do that now. Alright, so it went 20 feet in an average of 4.3 seconds. And if I divide 20 by 4.3, 20 divided by 4.3 gives me about 4.7 feet per second. And on my chart, that is excellent. It's even a little bit too high. So overall, we have one, two, three, four, five excellence and two fours. And one of the ways that we first think of, like how do we decide how to put those together, is like we'll average it. And if we have a bunch of excellence and a couple of fours, then it averages out to like a medium plus. But I want to think a little bit more about what those things actually mean. So. If we look at the things that are excellent and how much they matter to salmon, if we look at the things that are more and how much they matter to salmon, they might have different weights. Woody debris was really poor and the pools and riffles was also really poor. I think the pools and riffles thing was mostly because of the season, so I don't think it's actually that bad. It's just because of the amount of rain that we had recently. The woody debris is the only major issue that we have. So overall, I'd say our screen channel is mostly excellent. It just needs some more with the Alright, so the next thing we're going to look at is the macro invertebrates in the stream. And macro invertebrates is just a really fancy way of saying the bugs in the stream. So invertebrates are things with no backbone, and macro invertebrates are things with no backbone that are big enough to see without a microscope. So all the insects that you've ever seen are macro invertebrates. We're going to look at the stream macroinvertebrates, and we care about them for two reasons. The first reason is because they're super important food for baby salmon. Young salmon in the stream, their diet is mostly aquatic macroinvertebrates. And the second reason is because these are what we call indicator species. An indicator species is a species that tells us something about the health of the stream. So some macroinvertebrates need really clean water to survive. So if we find them, we know that the water is really clean. We divide those macroinvertebrates into three groups. Group one macroinvertebrates need really clean water. Without clean water, they can't live. Group two macroinvertebrates need medium to clean water. So if we find them, we know that the water isn't disgusting, but it could be just kind of mediocre. A group three macroinvertebrates can live pretty much anywhere. They can live in really gross water and they can really live in really nice water. So first we're gonna do a, an imaginary macroinvertebrate survey where these cards are the bugs that I could have pulled out of a screen. And we're gonna place them onto this poster to figure out what water quality we have. So I'm just gonna match my cards to the poster seem to have a lot of midges. And 
And this could be what we find in our real stream. But this will help us get an idea of how to analyze the data that we collect, how to take our sample of macroinvertebrates and figure out the stream's water quality. So we have, in group three, we found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We have eleven group three organisms. We have fourteen group two organisms and eight group one organisms. So it's kind of all over the board. How do we figure out what our water quality is? Well, you might say that since we have group three organisms, the water must be really gross. But we also have group one. If there were no group one organisms, then it could be gross. But since we have them, we know that the water has to be really clean. They tell us more information than the other groups do because these guys are the pickiest of all the bugs. And they can only tolerate really specific conditions. So we're gonna go try to catch some real bugs in a real stream and see what the Tolt River is like for our macro inverters. Okay, so since our bottom here is so rocky, it's gonna be pretty hard to use a net. So I'm just gonna look at the rocks. A lot of these bugs live on the rocks. And when I find them, I'm gonna put them in our highly scientific sampling device, also known as an ice tray. And that's where we'll keep them until we can identify them. Okay, so we're going to start to go through some of the critters that we caught. And these two right here are caddisfly larvae. So at some point in their lives, they'll go through metamorphosis and come out as a kind of caddisfly, which flies through the air and is a land insect. But these ones right here are the larvae, kind of like caterpillars. And what's really neat about them is you can see that it looks like they have this weird furry or spiky body. And that's actually a case that they build. So they take a bunch of different leaves and sticks and attach them together with silk, kind of like spider silk. And it's armor that they just wear at all times. Sometimes they'll even attach it to a rock so they'll be stuck in that one spot and they won't get swept away. And they use it for protection and for camouflage. They are in group one. All right, so this one, you can see how it looks like it has two tails. And that tells me that it is a stonefly nymph. So it will one day go through metamorphosis and become a stonefly. And these are also in group one. There is a nice view of them. So you can see those two antennae on the front, the six legs, even some wing pads on the back. So those are gonna develop into its wings. And then the two tails on its rear end. So this is a stonefly nymph and it just got buzzed past by a mayfly nymph. And that one's a little bit different and you can see it has three tails. Those three tails are actually gills. They're like feathers and they're full of veins and that's how it gets oxygen out of the water. So it also has the six legs, but it has the three gills on its rear end. These mayflies are usually vegetarians, so they eat algae and things off of the rocks. Whereas the stonefly is usually a predator. So that might be why the main mayfly was moving so pa fast past that stonefly. All three of these bugs are group one macroinvertebrates, which is awesome. That tells us our stream water quality is really, really good. The 
the last thing we have to look at is water chemistry. And I mentioned that now because indicator species are a good way to get a general feel for the chemistry of the water without having to actually test it. So since we found all of these group one bugs, looks like we found at least 10 different individuals. We know that the water quality is pretty good. So there's probably a decent amount of oxygen, a healthy pH, a healthy amount of phosphate, a healthy temperature, good turbidity or cloudiness. And these are all things that salmon need. So even without doing our water chemistry, we can make a pretty good guess of what the water chemistry is like in the Tilt River. And now we're gonna go let these guys go back into their habitat. All right, the last thing we're gonna do to assess our stream habitat health is test the water quality. So I'm gonna take a water sample down here and also test the turbidity down here. I'll do turbidity first. So turbidity is how cloudy the water is. And we want our water to be pretty clear. For salmon, a cloudy stream is like walking through a dust storm for us. So the salmon are trying to breathe. They're trying to get oxygen out of the water. And if there's a bunch of sand in there, that's gonna damage their gills. So we wanna measure how cloudy this water is. We're gonna do that with a turbidity tube. And the way this works is there's this disc down inside. And that disc is black and white. It's called a secchi disc. And when we fill this tube with water, we're gonna start emptying it out until we can see that disc again. And once we can see it, we'll take our measurement. The temperature of our water is about 11 and a half degrees Celsius, which is excellent. And if we look at our journal now for 48 centimeters on our turbidity, so our turbidity is also excellent. Next, let's do dissolved oxygen. So for dissolved oxygen, we have a vial this big. And we're gonna put two of these tablets in there. Screw the cap 
back on and just flip it back and forth until they dissolve. So one of the reasons we care about dissolved oxygen is similar to the reason that we care about oxygen in the air. We need to breathe it, right? And the salmon breathe oxygen in the water too with their gills. So we want to have plenty of dissolved oxygen in the water that they can pull out with their gills to breathe. And just like we need it to do all of our life functions, they do too. Okay, so now that our tablets have dissolved, we're going to wait for five minutes and see how the color changes. We're already seeing a little bit of pink to it. We're just going to put this guy over here and wait five minutes. And I'm going to start my timer. And then we'll move on to pH. So pH is a measure of how acidic or basic the water is. And I'll tell you more about it once I have the tablets in there. So we have this plastic tube. We're going to put 10 milliliters in. So that's just the whole tube. And then put one tablet in. until the tablet dissolves. So pH measures how acidic or basic the water is. And to kind of think about that in terms that we might be more familiar with, acidic things are things that are usually sour. So think about foods that have sour flavor on purpose, like Sour Patch Kids. If you look at their ingredients, there's probably something like citric acid in there. And that acid is what gives it the sour flavor. Basic things are usually things more like soap, so bleach is very basic. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14, where 0 is the most acidic, like battery acid, and 14 is the most basic, like bleach or lye. And pure water is somewhere in the middle around 7. And we want our stream to be pretty close to 7. Otherwise, it's not healthy for the salmon. Just like it's not healthy for us to touch something like battery acid or bleach. So that guy is gonna sit there for five minutes. And while we wait, we'll test our phosphate. Phosphate is a nutrient that's really important to have in streams. All organisms need phosphate or phosphorus. But if we have too much, the plants grow way too much and cause, create something called eutrophication. And when a stream is eutrophied, plants grow really fast, use up all the phosphate, and then die. And then when they decompose, that decomposition uses up a lot of oxygen, which is problematic for the salmon, because now they have no oxygen to breathe. So I'm gonna put one phosphate tablet in here. Shake it up, and that'll be another five minute one too. When it comes to phosphorus, we want there to be a little bit, because if there's none, then all of the organisms in that stream don't have one of the nutrients that they really need. But if there's a ton, then we have a eutrophication problem. So we want to have it somewhere in the middle, pretty low though. So it's been five minutes and we're going to start checking our different tests. So this is our dissolved oxygen tube. I'm going to hold it against the white card and compare it to the colors right here. And from here it looks like the middle one. It's pretty pink. So our dissolved oxygen is about 4 ppm. ppm stands for parts per million, which is kind of like percent. Percent is parts in a hundred, this is parts in a million. So, we have 4 ppm, and that's a pretty poor oxygen level. We'll check our pH. pH right here looks kind of like the bottom left, this one over here. 
it's about a six. And six is healthy for a salmon stream. You want it to be around six and a half to eight and a half. So somewhere around neutral, but not exactly. You're never going to find perfectly neutral water in nature because there's all sorts of stuff going on in there. There's decomposition happening, there's fish pee, there's dead bugs, there's probably chemicals for people's lawns, all sorts of stuff in that water. And even in the cleanest mountain stream, there's still animals and plants decomposing that are going to change the pH. Okay, it's been five minutes on our phosphate. It's turned a bit to blue. We're going to try to see how blue it is. And it's barely blue. I would call that probably the least just one part per million. And a healthy phosphate is zero to two parts per million. So that is excellent. So we have excellent temperature, excellent pH, excellent phosphate, excellent turbidity, and poor oxygen. And I would bet that the poor oxygen is probably just a function of our tablets not working well. So if we look at the stream, there are ripples and bubbles everywhere getting oxygen into that water. So I think that's just more of a technical error than the actual reality of the stream. It looks like our water quality overall is excellent. Now that we've assessed all four habitat aspects of the Tote River, we can decide whether this river provides healthy habitat for our native salmon. Looking at our riparian zone, stream channel, macroinvertebrate, and water chemistry data, do you think the Tote River provides a healthy habitat for Pacific Northwest salmon? Why or why not? How could the Tote River's habitat quality be improved? Make your case for or against the Tote River as salmon habitat. And if you'd like, share your ideas with us by emailing them to education at mtsgreenway.org. We're excited to hear what you think. All right, see you guys.